The latest iPad Pro was one of the quieter tech announcements lately, but I think it deserves a little extra attention. Just because it's not as exciting as a lot of the other news right now, it's still one of the best pieces of hardware ever, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why we should still be interested in it. But I didn't want to do all the talking myself, so I invited a few friends on. Rene Ritchie is the name that you know if you follow Apple News, because he has his finger on the pulse. So I got him to tell me what is new in the iPad Pro. Rene, what do we have new this year? There's not so much new as I would say aspirational. Like you do get six gigabytes of RAM across all the models, not just the one terabyte model anymore. Uh, and there is an additional core uh, that's active now. Previously, one of the cores wasn't active and that's just a way to save money when you have massive amounts of chips coming off a of fab and you don't wanna throw all of them away if you don't need all the cores. But now the process is advanced enough and they're making enough and the yields are better and the prices are down that they can actually get all eight GPU cores functional. So you do get a little bit bigger uh, GPU performance, wider, I actually say, GPU performance out of it. But the biggest change, the most obvious change is the wide angle camera and the LiDAR scanner on the big honking mm. bump on the back. So it's a series of spec bumps in all the places that we want to see it. Um, I, I think it's useful to remember what were the exciting features we got last time, because it's not all about you know all the new features every single update. 2018 had my favorite iPad ever. Let's remind ourselves what was new in the 2018. The last update was just massive. They redesigned the whole thing. It got its iPhone 10 style makeover ditched the home button, went from lightning to USB-C, went from touch ID to face ID. It got thinner, of course. It got a better camera system, way more powerful chipset. And all of that is being carried over into this new model. I think anybody that bought a 2018, like, just don't worry about it. You don't need to be deciding whether or not to buy this one. It's probably not the right upgrade for you. But anyone with an older iPad, I think what it really means is that now the new best iPad is more best. I think that's exactly right. And I also think for developers who are getting interested in augmented reality and are anticipating the next iPhone, which is supposed to have the same LiDAR capabilities, this gives them a good six months, maybe nine months of runway to get their apps ready for when it goes onto the iPhone. Because the iPad is it's huge, but it's still relatively small scale for Apple. And when the iPhone comes out, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people suddenly getting the types of apps they've never seen before. The only thing worse than those things not being ready yet for the iPad would be those things not being ready yet for the iPhone. I'm a little sad that I don't have anything really crazy I can do with my iPad today, but I am excited to see where it goes in the future. Thanks for letting me know, Renee. And also, you do have a brand new YouTube channel, so anybody that hasn't subscribed to the new Rene, go uh, find him now, link in description. The complete physical redesign of the iPad Pro is still relatively recent. We got that magnetic pencil, which I absolutely love. And just as a reminder, here's what the iPad Pro looked like not that long ago. Very interestingly, this is actually the same size. This is the 12.9 inch. This is the same size of screen in both of these. But I think this redesign was a massive improvement. If you haven't already heard, there's also great news for all iPad owners out there that it now has mouse support. So even if you have an older trackpad like this one, you can just start using a mouse. You can even use a real mouse and it has cursor support and it's done incredibly well. Apple also announced a new smart case that integrates that trackpad into the keyboard. That is really exciting. And that might be the thing that makes me start using an iPad a lot more for my creative professional workflows. One of the only things that you can identify the new ones with is this bigger camera module on the back. I wanted to know what's going on in there, so I talked to a friend that did a complete breakdown of the iPad camera. Sebastian DeWitt is the developer of Halide, one of my favorite iOS photography apps. He understands this thing inside and out from a creative and technical perspective. Okay, the iPad isn't my primary camera. I take a lot more photos to my iPhone, but I know people still use it. What have you found in your deep dive into the new iPad cameras? The first thing I kind of assumed that we would find on the back, you know, they didn't introduce it with all the fanfare that they usually have, where they have a keynote presentation and Phil Schiller's there on stage with a cool 3D animation of the camera module splitting apart and showing all the different pieces of it. Um, you'd expect it to just be the iPhone 11, you know, the iPhone 11 module slapped on the mm -hmm. back of this iPad, and then like, you just, get the same lenses and you put a LiDAR array in there where the flash goes. Uh, but that's not the case. There are different lenses, there are different sensors, and uh, there are different focal lengths even, two millimeter narrower than the iPhone 11. The sensor on it is not as good as the one in the iPhone 11 either. Uh, and obviously there's that LiDAR sensor, which unfortunately, as it stands, photographically we cannot do anything with yet. Can you imagine, especially you know wearing your developer hat, designer hat, what 
could we possibly do with this someday in the future? Can you think of any future applications for it, for, especially for photography? Yeah, it's interesting because we obviously immediately started digging into it. I'm pretty sure we'll eventually see the sensor on iPhones. This seems like a path that Apple wants to, you know, yeah, I guarantee put in for the long, the long game. Yeah, <laughs> we can definitely consider that to be a done deal. Um, but as like I said, you, you cannot really do anything with it right now in photography. There's a lot of ways to use it in an AR kit. Um, and even out of the box, I mean, when I unboxed this thing, I was like, cool, let's try out the LiDAR sensor. Wait, how do I... Where do I use it? And the measurement app, which is in there, that's that little known AR app Apple has to measure like, you know, two points. That one is currently the one that uses it out of the box the most. So you can point it at a room and then it'll now auto detect a window, for instance. What's what's already magical is uh, that you can just bring up AR like that or measure and it just works right that's away. That's like crazy that it recognizes a window though. I didn't realize that. This is way more for detecting big spaces and the the angle is about the same as the ultra wide lens so it projects a very wide big array and then it, it mostly computes data and starts making a 3d model of its surroundings if you move it around a lot so if we were to be trying to make a it's like a portrait mode if even if we could we can't right now using that data it probably wouldn't be all that precise you can't just make a nice outline with it um, once start, people start moving it, maybe we'll get kind of a rough 3D model, but we still have to combine it with the data of those two camera sensors and the difference in the parallax between them, much like the iPhones do it right now. Um, but that does come, that does bring to mind ideas like, hey, maybe portrait mode for video would work really well with this, because that way you get this really fast 3D data that would help you finally segment that accurately. What is the most interesting about hardware additions like this is, is stuff that we haven't thought about at all. There's all sorts of little measurement details that were in the original iPhone that when we saw the announcement, we're like, what good is this accelerometer ever gonna be? Like, why do we need a gyroscope in here? Why do we need a barometer in our phone? And gradually, <laughs> We find out why it's useful and it takes a little while, but uh, so far all of those additions have had real payoffs in the long run. Yeah, and I think one of those things which is also probably in our mind is like, why is Apple betting so much on AR in general? Like why aren't there APIs for us photography apps to use the LiDAR sensor and why is it all on the AR side? And it's obvious they're putting a lot of wood behind that AR arrow. I'm pretty curious to see what kind of product comes out of that. An obvious application for some developers, I mean, especially people doing like interactive game stuff or creation tools is photogrammetry when you're able to just move your camera around in real space and it's basically scanning objects. I know that's not necessarily something that your traditional photography, I mean, yours is a photo app. This starts crossing over between like photography starts becoming a different way of capturing reality. I don't know. I don't know how to phrase that as a question, but like, can you see how these two worlds are going to collide as we get a lidar sensor on it? Pretty funny. We uh, we've already built a proof of concept. Wow. Uh, it is totally possible. It's really cool, and you can share uh, 3D models as a USDZ, so like as an AR thing, and other people can walk through the so suppose you know reality you captured. It's pretty cool. There's some limitations, obviously, with camera quality and the way you store the textures and stuff, but. There's cool applications there for sure. It is it is very possible. I'm just going to imagine the world of where this could go. Uh, you tell me if it's plausible or not. Is that a photograph? A photograph right now is just effectively a flat representation from a single angle of a single thing. But it could start becoming more of a 3D capture. So if you've start if you pre-scan your room and then you take a photo of the person inside of the room, you could just start having a different relationship between that single image and the background. So being able to do interesting composites or you could do similar things to if anybody's seen the behind the scenes of the Mandalorian, they're projecting video game graphics onto big screens behind real life actors. If all of a sudden your phone could start seeing reality in that same way where it knows the difference between a live person standing in front of them and it's also got a 3D mapped other room in the background. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to create with this, but it starts getting towards Mandalorian world, which is pretty cool with just one small piece of hardware. One of the things that for me that came to mind is like that camera you have in the first Blade Runner movie where he captures, he has this sort of Polaroid, but he can move around in the photo kind of in 3D right. a little bit. And it seems like, I feel like, you know, totally. the, the tools are all, all the technology is sort of coming together to transform photography from that classic, you know, this this version mm -hmm. of photography 
to something which we we you know probably won't even recognize anymore in 50 years because of all the data that goes into okay one here's image. what here's what it can be it's you take okay we got live photos you keep that same brand name they're still called live photos but yeah now it's got that blade runner 3d thing you're talking about and all of a sudden it's not just that you can play the video but you can go into the world where the photo was taken and look around the room oh this is gonna be cool it's going to be pretty cool. I mean, even just giving depth data to every pixel and adding a little bit of extra context in that would be really, really impressive. <laughs> Let's start small. The only thing is the privacy implication. <laughs> yeah, true, true. You know? Photography isn't going anywhere. I mean, we will always have Polaroids. We're always going to have still photos, but having new opportunities is only an exciting thing. Sebastian, thanks so much for your insights. Sure. Yeah. But of course, a computer isn't just specs. It's what you actually do with it. What can you create? So I talked to one of our favorite creators out there, I, Justine, about the things that she's been creating on her new iPad Pro. This is kind of crazy because, so I didn't really use my iPad as much before, but now that I am at home and just doing a lot more like email and just like conference calls and stuff, I've actually been using this iPad a lot. And then I got one of these. It's a little hype mic. And that so goes directly USB-C, into, it, oh, okay, It goes cool. right into the iPad. You don't do anything. It just like works. So I was like, oh my gosh. Should I start an iPad podcast? In general, what are the things that an iPad has been the most useful for you traditionally? Like, what do you usually use it for? And I guess, what what are you doing differently now? Yeah, I think mostly just because I feel like I mostly was using an iPad before just to watch content. And then I would actually do editing and stuff on my computer. But now I've just been using the iPad as a, well, I also did this test where Apple kept saying, this could be your well, your computer, but not a computer. Right. I was like, but yeah. can, it, can I edit an entire video on here and be satisfied? Because I just wanted to make sure. So I did, it was like my birthday quarantine vlog. It was like the first day of lockdown was like my birthday. So I'm like, you know what I'm going to do for my birthday? I'm going to learn to edit on the iPad. So I used LumaFusion. I shot everything on my iPhone, edited the entire 14, 15 minute vlog on my iPad, did the VO, added music. And I was like, oh, all right. So I guess I can do everything. And it was just like a really refreshing moment because I was like, I can do everything on here. I mean, obviously it's not a huge upgrade from the the previous iPad Pro, but I've been really enjoying it. So like I'm now a new, new iPad fan. <laughs> and then because it all synced through iCloud, I just like opened my iPad and all that footage from my iPhone oh, that's was awesome. already there on LumaFusion. So I didn't really have to do anything. It just kind of worked. Actually, yeah, I didn't even think about that way. I always imagine doing airdrop, but I guess you don't have to yeah, if you, you have it set up like that. You didn't have to. I mean, you'd still have to wait for it to download. Right. But I was like, this is great. I, I almost wanted to do it all the time. You might still be wondering, what do I think of the iPad Pro? I don't think you can say enough good things about this hardware. It is an incredible computer. It feels good to use. It's just a pleasure to be on your desk. But even with the huge improvements it's been making, it does still get in the way of some of my professional creative production. So depending on your workflow, this may not apply to you. You might be able to do everything that you need to. For me, I still find multitasking difficult to use. I don't remember the shortcuts that get me from app to app quickly or have multiple ones on screen. I've always found it a little bit confusing. And maybe I'm just old and this is my problem, but I'm just being honest, it is easier for me to navigate around on a Mac still. And the other thing I'm still hoping for is deeper integration with external drives. So there's been some big improvements with USB-C being able to plug in directly with a thumb drive or a NAR box or whatever you wanna use. But the photos and videos I use in my workflow are too big to store them all internally on the iPad, so I need to be able to reference them on the external drive, meaning when I'm using Lightroom or LumaFusion, I can keep them external without copying them into the iPad. Once we get past that hurdle, I'll be editing a lot more photos and videos on here. But overall, this is a ridiculously good piece of hardware and does show us where the future of computing lies, especially with LiDAR. Thanks again to my guests for coming on. If you guys wanna know more about this, we've talked about it a whole bunch on the podcast. I talked to I, Justine, and to Sam Sheffer, and they both had some interesting insights about how they use their iPads. So thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.